Well, good morning. A little under the weather this morning, I got hit with the plague on Friday, and so I've had, uh, my eyes are running, my focus is, I am having a hard time focusing, and uh, you know, so hopefully you can bear with me, I'll get through this morning, so I'm just going to start with a word of prayer for myself that I can get through this uh, this morning. And, but also I want to pray, yesterday was a day of repentance and mourning for the millions of babies who've been aborted, and I want us to continue to pray this morning uh, for that, and that uh, Christians will wake up and uh, we will be more vocal in um, speaking out and also praying for another Supreme Court justice to be appointed so that uh, we can overturn Roe versus Wade would be a wonderful thing. Um, when, I think of, when I think of all the millions of babies who've been murdered, um, it's something that uh, many times we don't, want to, we don't even want to think about it or talk about it, but I do think it's necessary. So this morning I just want to start out just praying for that and our church as well. Father, we come to you today and we know that you are a God who sees all things and knows all things. And Father, the injustices in, in this fallen world that we live in, uh, some are, are so heinous and so unbelievable as to what's recently taken place in our government and uh, in New York and uh, watching a video of, of the vote and uh, the law that was passed and the celebration, the applause and cheering uh, that uh, children can be aborted um, uh, up to just the last minute, Lord. And, and just it's unbelievable, uh, Father, that we see things like this. And so we pray that the people will be put in place to change these laws and for us as a church and the churches and uh, all of those who believe in this um, heinous crime, this murder, this genocide, Lord, that we would speak out and we would be um, disgusted and we would make it clear, uh, Father, of where we stand as believers in this area. And so, God, we uh, do um, pray for your mercy on our nation, and we do pray for our nation to repent uh, for these areas and so many other things that are going on in the world today. Father, we, as we look around the world, we see that we need Jesus Christ more and more in our individual lives, but we also need the boldness and the courage to speak out and to be salt and light in this world that we're living in today. And so, Father, we just bring these things before you, and I do pray you'd help me to be clear in what I try to say today, these very important scriptures that we look at. And, um, God, we just look forward to what you're going to do this morning, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, we're in Romans chapter 8, and we've been in Romans chapter 8, and we kind of, I don't want to say we're stuck here, but this is some really great truths. And uh, starting in, uh, I'm just going to touch on, do a little review on Romans 8, verses 1 through 5, but really summarizing it all up is this. We're free at last because of what took place at Calvary and because of who we are in Christ and our position in Christ. We are free from sin. We're free from the bondage of sin. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. Our lives are changed. They should be radically different from where we were before Christ. And Paul makes it very clear in his appeal to the Romans here. Uh, Chapter 7 was dealing with our justification, how we have been made just once and for all before our God. And then the other areas of sanctification, of what God is doing in our lives, how he's working and transforming us and making us more into the image of Christ and changing our thoughts, changing our behavior, changing our, our, our hopes and our dreams. And, and if we began to really wake up as individuals and truly gra- could grasp what God has done and what it all means to us, we would live entirely different lives. I'm convinced of that. And so as we continue to allow the Spirit of God to work in our lives, let's just look at this, and I'm going to move through these areas of Romans 8, uh, the first five verses here. The No condemnation, there's no more punishment for those who are in Christ. Uh, but there will be punishment for those who uh, have rejected Jesus Christ and those who uh, continue to um, undermine the things of God. There will be, there will be punishment, and it is uh, beyond anything we can even comprehend. But for believers, we will not face that punishment because of the work of Calvary, the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 1, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in 
Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful men to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. This new position, this new standing, a new identity we have is truly life-changing. We're born again. We're, we were born into this world dead spiritually, and these bodies, this world controlled everything we thought, everything we did. But thanks be to God, and what he has done for us is sent his son to die for us, and he gave us his Holy Spirit. And so he opened the gates of heaven. The sin issue that separated us from a holy God was dealt with once and for all at Calvary. It forever changed the world. Our world is so much different today because of Christ coming into it and because of our great God and Savior sent Jesus to take our place that his righteousness was imputed to us. He took our sin, he gave us his righteousness. So everything that we have, everything that we know and do is because of his great mercy and his great love and his great patience for us. And so what I just love the fact that, that trying to behave and be religious isn't a way to know him, but it is by believing better. It is by knowing who he is and what he has done and what he has for us and the power that he has left us with through the person of the Holy Spirit, how that can tr truly transform our society. Somehow, I think as Christians, we have forgotten, we've drifted away from the reality that we can control and we can have an impact in where our world is going today. We can do something about the world that we're living in today. Do you believe that? No, you don't. <laughs> I don't think you do. And I'm just keeping it real. Because if we fully understood the potential that the church of Jesus Christ has in the world today, things would be different. They'd be different. Now, I'm not lay, trying to lay a guilt trip on you. I just know in my own life that, you know, I can be silent at times when I don't need to be silent. I can be bolder when I need to be bolder. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. So I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on you. But I do think somehow we have lost our way as a body of people with the power of the church, if the church of Christ really, really stood for what we needed to stand for, I think we would see some drastic changes in our culture. I know that God is sovereign. I know that God is in control. But he gives us this privilege of being able to have an impact in the world around us, in the sphere that is around us. We can make a difference in the world around us. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. We're getting there. What, we're, what I believe today is as I look at Romans here and I look at Paul's great letter to us, he tells us these things that we're secure in him, we're free in him, and we're positionally perfect in him. Those, my friends, are, are joys and things that we rejoice in, that we are positionally perfect. We need nothing to be made righteous. We have everything necessary to live life in a godly life, to live an abundant life, to live a victorious life. We are more than conquerors through Christ through his blood, through his resurrection, and that reality. So this position we have, this new birth, the fact that we have the Holy Spirit, the very Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit who was part of creating the heavens and the earth, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, living and dwelling within us. Oh, if we could only come to grips with that reality, how our lives would look different. I know my life... I sometimes doubt. I sometimes doubt, and I find myself in situations where I'm like, well, can I really do this? Well, I don't know. I argue with myself, and in reality, when I look at what the Scripture says, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing that can keep us from accomplishing what God has for us if we're willing, willing to trust him. It's about believing in who he is and what he has done for us. It's not about our ability. We can't live the Christian life apart from him. We've all probably tried it. Many of you may be doing it this morning. It doesn't work. And you're going to fall flat on your face. Verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those, there is a contrast here. Paul's making a contrast. People who live 
and don't know God and, or people who live in the flesh and have no desire to even walk with God. They may know God, but they're kind of stumbling through life not realizing what they have. It's like being a billionaire and not even realizing it. But anyway, it goes on to say, the sinful nature, they have their minds set on the nature that des- what that desires. But, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set. They have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. You see, life, living this life and just going through the motions of a person in this life isn't much of a life at all. If we, you know, we come to Christ and we get our fire insurance and we know, oh, I'm going to heaven, I believe that, and then somehow we kind of drift away, we kind of just kind of go through the motions of, the, of life, and we're missing out on so much that God has for us because we're so focused on us. We're so focused on this narcissistic world that we're living in where it's all about us, it's all about me, and what can I get out of this life? And that has crept into the church. It has crept into the church, and it has consumed many who know Jesus Christ. And it doesn't have to be that way. So if your heart and your mind is set on what the Spirit desires, you're going to think and act and live differently. The proof of that is this next verse here, life in peace. Life and peace. My next point is life and peace if. Life and peace if. The mind of sinful man is death. We all know that. But the mind controlled, the mind that is controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Do you get that? If your mind is controlled by the Holy Spirit, you will have life and you will have peace. You see, it requires it requires us making a, a decision. It requires us to th- have a thinking process where we choose to follow God. We choose to do what God wants us to do. We are listening to the Word of God. We are listening to the Spirit of God, and it will completely transform our lives. I know when I first became a Christian at 19, boy, I needed a lot of work, and I still do. But when I came to Christ at 19, the Holy Spirit began to chip away at things in my life and remove things from my life. And I am so thankful for that today. I'm so thankful that he didn't leave me alone. And this is the beauty of the spiritual battle, the war that we have. God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. He loves you too much to leave you the way you are. So if there's a battle going on within you, that is awesome. I'm so excited for you if you're battling this morning with your life and your decisions in your life. That's a good thing because we're in a battle. We are in a spiritual war, but many Christians don't believe it because we're all secret agent Christians. Nobody knows you're an agent for God. Nobody knows. You know how to grow a church? We grow a church by inviting people to church. We grow a church by reaching out to people. Relationship evangelism is where it's at, ladies and gentlemen. Reaching out to people, people that are in need, and they're all around us. People are drowning all around us. So... As we look at this, mind that is controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile toward God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Nor can it do so. So in our own capacity, we couldn't come to God. We couldn't understand God. It's all the grace of God that he brought us to a point where we knew we needed him. It has been said that we all have this Christ-shaped vacuum within us, that there's this part of us that desires to know God, but yet we don't want anything to do with God. There's this tug of war going on. And so the Spirit of God draws us to, to an understanding of who he is, and then God transforms our lives. There's a metamorphosis that takes place, a complete transformation as we allow the Spirit of God to work in our mind. But if somebody is is hostile toward God and has no desire to obey God, then you have to really wonder, do they truly know God? And there's plenty of people who are religious enough and go to church enough that they believe they have a relationship with God. We were talking, I think, Wednesday night in a Bible study, and someone brought up uh, the idea that some people, if you ask them if they're going to heaven or not, they say, yeah, I'm a good person. No, you're not. No, we're not. We're not good people. Because God's standard says the wages of sin is death. And the reality of this is all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not one that seeks after God. So the reality is, are you going to heaven? Well, because you're a good enough person, that doesn't work. Because we've all sinned and fallen short. God's perfect standard is perfect holiness. Not 99.9, it's holy, complete, perfect holiness. 
And the only way that that takes place is the imputation of Christ's righteousness. He gave us his complete, perfect righteousness in exchange for our sinfulness. There was the great exchange that took place. And because of that, we are new creations, we have the Holy Spirit of God, and God has all these great things laid out for us to live this life and experience in this life as we suffer. And we're going to be talking about that next week, suffering for Jesus. Yes, being a Christian and walking with Jesus requires suffering. We've all suffered. We will suffer. If you haven't, you will suffer. But the suffering that we suffer in this country is so much different than people who are suffering in other parts of the world, even this morning. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me keep going here. Those controlled by the spirits, the, excuse me, those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled, and I love this here. He makes this distinction here. Paul makes it very clear. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. Okay, there's a distinction here. By the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. Okay, here's the condition. The condition here is if the Spirit of God lives within you. So you've got to ask yourself the question, does the Spirit of God live within you? The only way that can happen is for you to know Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection, and not relying on any work, not on your works, not on your birthright, not on anything other than your faith in Christ alone, by the grace of God alone. So he goes on to say here, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So if a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit of God, they do not belong to Christ. They, there is the stamp of God's earnest, that is the Holy Spirit, that when a person comes to know Christ, they get the Holy Spirit. What a gift that is. That goes beyond anything we can comprehend. We won't, we won't know until we get to heaven someday what an incredible gift the Holy Spirit was to us. Uh, you know, we have the Holy Spirit, and some of us are sensitive in that relationship toward him, and we're all growing in that relationship with the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and the capacity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But it's so important that we understand that if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble this morning if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God. And the way you know you have the Holy Spirit of God is because he, he is the administrator of all truth in our lives. You cannot understand anything in the Word of God apart from the Holy Spirit of God. The greatest gift that you have is the Holy Spirit of God who helps you understand spiritual truth. Because the human mind, the human capacity cannot understand the things of God apart from the Holy Spirit of God. So anything you may have ever learned in your life as a Christian or you're ever going to learn in your life is a gift from God. Your salvation is a gift of God and your capacity to know and walk with God is a gift from God. Amen? Great truth, great truth. So then he goes on to say here, verse 10, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. So because Christ came in, into our, our bodies, our lives, he quickened us, he made us alive spiritually, and he says here, the body is dead. We know that the body is dead. In the bed, the body is dying. As, you know, being sick with the flu or whatever I've got, boy, I don't like it because I can't function properly. And then you take medication like to clear up your sinuses and you feel like you're in outer space you ever have that okay like i'm up here and the room is spinning right now you all look very fuzzy this morning anyway but if christ is in you your body is dead because of sin yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness so this body is dead but i'm alive spiritually there's this paradox there's this great great struggle that goes on here it's like Okay, well, this body is dead, I'm alive, I'm breathing, but the body is dead, but the spirit is alive. So it's only because of Christ imputed righteousness. His life is in us. Our lives are changed. We are now different people than, were we, than we were before Christ. And as we continue to grow and mature and move toward Christ, God is in this process of changing us and transforming us in, in a miraculous way. And there's no other explanation for it other than it is miraculous work of the Spirit of God. When you see lives changed, um, the, the greatest joy is seeing somebody come to Jesus Christ 
and then seeing that person begin to grow in spiritual truths and in spiritual life and to be able to realize that they're not bound by their past sin. We've been freed from sin, so we no longer have to sin. We still can choose to sin, but we sin less and less as God works in our lives. And what I love is, is, is where, I, you know, where we all were, where if you can remember back to when you first became a Christian, what God has done in your life, how God has transformed your life and continues to transform your life. But what's great is we're all growing at different, where everyone in this room is in a different place this morning. We have the same Holy Spirit, but we're all growing. We're all seeing things and learning things at a different pace, perhaps. And then, of course, there's the school of hard knocks, those things that you go through as a believer that are unique to you and take you to places where you never thought you would ever go or ever want to go. But the Spirit and the power of God brings you through those circumstances and those situations to where you're able to see him in a whole different way, to understand him in a whole different way because of your struggle, because of your battle, because of your need to be totally dependent upon him. And the world, the world tells us that we can do it by ourselves. We don't need God. We can do things by ourselves. What, what a lie. What a lie. Then he goes on to say here, in this next part, verse 12, we are led as sons. This is a, one of the other greatest truths I'm just flying through this stuff here this morning, but this is such a great truth. Verse 12 says this, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. You will die. But if by the Spirit you will put to death the misdeeds of the body and you will live. One of the greatest truths is is that whatever you may struggle with, uh, and, and I deal with people who struggle with substance abuse and alcohol abuse and gambling abuse and every kinds of abuse that there is and every kind of sin, and, and I think I've probably heard it all uh, in the years that I've been in ministry. But you know what? We're not defined by our sin. We are defined by who we are in Christ. And if our eyes are on Christ and what he has done and what he is doing in our life and how he's transforming us, we're not confined to what we, what we were or what our label was. Our label is not Tom Hawking, sinner, drug addict, whatever, you know, whatever I was, whatever I did, a liar, cheater, use of obscenity. That's not my identity. That's what I was. But God sees me as a son, as Jesus Christ. And boy, when we can get our focus off of what we were and on who we are and who we are becoming, it transforms your life. It completely changes your whole direction. Because any one of you who's ever done anything in your life, uh, whatever it may be, be it athletics or music or whatever academic field you're in, you have that fear of stepping out for the first time. You know, you go to school and then you have the commencement exercise and then there's the commencement exercise and they throw you out under the bus and now it's up to you to do something with the education that you received in whatever discipline, whatever that may be. It's terrifying to go from a commencement exercise into the real world, isn't it? Because you realize when you get into the real world, what you learn in school may not help you at all. Right? Right? Yeah, some of the things you learn in school didn't, done, doesn't help you at all. How many people go to school and, and get, a, a, get a degree in a particular area and they're not using that de- degree in their life today for all kinds of reasons? So when we come to the point where we understand that the Spirit of God is using everything in our life, past, present, and future, it completely transforms us. But he goes on to say here, but if, the spirit of, <clears throat> but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you again, get this, a slave again to fear. One of the greatest truths and lies of the devil is fear. He's constantly trying to cause us to fear. There's like 366 verses in the Bible on fear, how we are to fear not, and we are to put our trust in God. But what does the enemy try to do? He tries to create fear within us to put us back in bondage so that we can't function in the way that God chooses us to function, to step out and take risks for Jesus Christ, to step out and be bold for the things of God, to be able to be able to say things in a in a in a loving way in a communication against the sins and the sin of this world, it's amazing what God'll do. That we are no longer slaves again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship, the spirit of sonship. 
That is such a great truth. The spirit of sonship. So I received the Holy Spirit as part of the down payment on my future that God has for me, but God puts within me and with us this, this new relationship of being sons of God, not just sinful people that are trying their very best that someday when they get to heaven, they may get to pick up what's left over from the horses or whatever. You know, you ever think that when you get to heaven, well, maybe I'll be lucky enough to do dishes or rake someone's yard or, you know, I don't know if you ever think those things. Probably just me. <laughs> but, but, but we're sons. We are sons. We have the sonship. And by him we cry, again, Abba, Father, Daddy. We have this father-son relationship. It's no longer, re- it's not this religious idea that, that we hope We're reaching for something we can never grasp. That's what religion does. Religion is always keeping it just out of reach of you. The fear of of whatever it may be, it's always out of reach. You can never know for sure you're saved. You can never know for sure you're going to heaven. You can never know for sure you're forgiven. You live a constant life of your disappointing God. You are a disappointment to God. Some of you have heard that your whole life. There's someone in my life right now that I'm getting to know as a person whose entire life they've never heard their mother say, I love you. 31 years old, never heard their mother even say, I love you. Can you imagine? And, never, and nothing you ever do is ever good enough. Maybe some of you have grown up in homes like that, but that's not where you are with the Lord. He loves you that he sent Jesus to die for you. He gave you the Holy Spirit. He's given you the word of God. There's nothing that we can't do through Christ. Through Christ Jesus, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Isn't that amazing? We're not limited to your education. You're not limited to how much money you make. You're not limited to your gifts or your abilities. It's more and beyond everything you can imagine. If only we would act on that. If only we would respond to that. So, sonship, we have this relationship. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. How? How do we know that? Well, he gives you peace. He gives you understanding. He gives you knowledge. He gives you the ability to open the Bible and read it and and understand this incredible love letter that God has given us is something that is beyond anything that we we can really grasp in this life is this intimacy that God has. Think of the word, of inti- the word intimacy. God wants to have an intimate relationship with each and every one of you. He cares about you. He wants to know how your day is. He wants to know what your dreams are. He wants to know what your fears are. He wants, and, and so, so you picture the billions of people on the face of this earth, and, and we're all crying out to God for different things at different times, God doesn't miss a one. He doesn't miss a one. And he hears them all. And he has answers for each and every one of us. And and he doesn't miss a thing. And we're going to be talking about Romans 8 here a little bit about how the Holy Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. We're going to get to that. But boy, those are some powerful truths. And he intercedes for us when we don't even know what to say. And I'll be honest with you, most of us don't know what to pray we find ourselves in situations, we think, well, I got it all figured out. This is how I should pray about the situation. Maybe not. But God knows, and he knows our heart, and God is on the case. He is on the case. He cares about every one of us, an intimate love relationship with us. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us. It wasn't just to maybe give us some hope, maybe, or if we're, if we're lucky enough and, and if we work hard enough at our religion that maybe we'll be in his presence someday. No. Not at all. So anyway, let's move on. This whole idea of him testifying. Verse 17. Now if we are God's children, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Wow. Isn't that something? Heir, we are heirs, uh, entitled to uh, the full inheritance as an adult son. And part of the Greek culture, the Roman culture, is this significance of of inheriting everything 
that we, we never really should have inherited at all, but because we are jo- we're joint heirs with Christ, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You can't get your mind around that. I don't care how much you try, you can't get your mind around that. And this idea that, that if we are co-heirs with him, we will share with him in his glory. But also there's this word suffering. We don't hear about the suffering part much in church. I had breakfast with someone this week and they were saying that they visited a number of churches and they said they never hear about suffering and they always hear the, the good time theology that we're just all going to be fat, dumb, and happy theology, okay? And, and it's like everything's great and you're going to be a millionaire. If you, if you give a lot of money, you're going to get a lot of money. And if, if you're not healthy, you'll get healthy and all these other stuff. And it's a bunch of hogwash. It's not reality. So there is suffering, but there's also the reality of what we know is what is coming. So as we, and we suffer through this life, and, and you know what, I've, we've all suffered, I have suffered in my life, but you know what, I thank God for everything that's come into my life, the good and the bad and the ugly. I'm thankful for it because it has done something in me and, and through me to draw me closer to the Lord. It's through those things in my life that I struggle with uh, and, and that that draws me closer into a deeper relationship with the Lord and makes me understand how much he loves me and he loves us. But it, there is some suffering, so in his glory. But, but here again, you've got to remember what Paul, the apostle Paul, what he went through. He was stoned and left, dragged out of the city and left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten multiple times, 39 times, which would have killed the average person. Paul suffered, and Paul suffered, and Paul suffered. So when Paul writes about suffering, we will never suffer the way Paul suffered. But when he writes about suffering, and he talks about, and we're going to see this next week, he talks about the suffering we have is nothing to be compared to the glory that we're going to experience in heaven. Nothing is going to compare to the glory that we're going to have with him. So there's good news that's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. Have you ever been lost in an area you don't want to be lost in. I remember going through Detroit one time, and we were lost, and we're out of gas, and we pulled off the freeway, and we pulled up to this place. It was like a pillbox. I mean, the glass was this thick, and, and there was nothing living around there at all. It was like a wasteland. And I, I remember being in this, I got back in the car and said, we're going to pray that we get to another gas station, because I'm afraid to even stand out and pump gas here. It was so bad. But gee, have you ever been in that place where it's like, boy, you just... You're hoping that you make, it to, and you make it to that next exit or whatever. You're in a place and you don't want to be there. I worked with gangs in Chicago, and we were in areas where you don't want to be. You don't want to be there, and yet God has you there. But what's great about the truth of God is this. If he has you in this place and he's taking you to this place, he has a something for you that's right around the corner. And that's where the hope lies. That's where the glory lies. In, in Christianity. So I guess the big question I want to ask as I close with this morning is this. <clears throat> I would just want to challenge you with this is putting your faith in what God wants to do with you in the future, today and in the future, to trust in what God through the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you and lead you in, to recognize the fact that, that uh, um, the chapter starts with no condemnation and it ends with no separation when we get to the end of Romans 8. So we're in this great place as believers. We have all this tremendous hope. We have all the power to live abundant lives. We have the ability to, to live beyond our capacities. And I just want to challenge you with what are we going to do with those truths? What are we going to do with the world around us when we go back to work Monday morning, tomorrow morning, back to the real world? What are we going to do with these things? And, and will we choose to say no to some things and yes to some other things? So that's my challenge you today is wrecking, realizing the fact that there's a tremendous glory that we're going to experience in the future, but it re- might require some suffering and some pain in this life in the future. And, uh, you know, I was looking, I was talking to friend of mine who was in Venezuela on a missions trip and we we're talking about Venezuela and what was going on there and, and uh, he was talking about being there as doing missions work and boy you just see these people you know just to have a bottle of water you know the, 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 the horrendous things that are going on in other parts of the world 
And uh, we've got these remote controls. We can change the station real fast, can't we? And so as we look at the world around us, uh, it's so easy to become so focused in our little sphere. So my, my prayer is that as we start praying for like changing things like the abortion laws and praying for more freedom for believers and praying for protection for believers in our other parts of the world, but also for boldness for you, whatever that looks like, whatever that looks like, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. <clears throat> thank you for your grace and your mercy and your patience and your love. Thank you for your word that you've given us through the Apostle Paul and, Father, the fact that he talks about this glory that we can experience now uh, because we know you, but also in the future what we will experience goes beyond anything we can comprehend. But thank you, Father, for the privilege of, of being able to serve you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who convicts us, who directs us, who protects us. He is the administrator of truth in our lives and the fruit in our lives. So, Father, draw us closer to you uh, through whatever means you desire. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for this morning. And, Father, we continue to praise you for the great God you are, the great Savior of sending your Son, Jesus, as a man to die for us, to take our sin and give us, exchange it with your righteousness is beyond anything we can ever comprehend. And we praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.